Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Michael Scheuer, who is the former head of the CIA's Bin Laden unit and of its rendition program. His new book is Marching Toward Hell, America and Islam After Iraq. Michael, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me. Where were you born and raised? In Buffalo, New York, a little town outside of Buffalo. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, I think uh, they were of what the, what's called the greatest generation, and they were very, uh, my parents were very patriotic. Voting was very important to them, and uh, doing the right thing for your country and for your locality was always very important. So I think that's, I was very much grounded in that kind of an of a attitude. And uh, what got you interested in world politics? I mean, were you, were you reading the newspaper when you were young? Not really. I, I, I studied history in school. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I, when I finished my PhD, there was no jobs for history teachers. And I just took a flyer at uh, applying for the Central Intelligence Agency. And I was extraordinarily fortunate to be accepted. And, and I had a very, um, from my perspective, a very wonderful career there. And so let's talk a little about your education. Where did you get your degree? I did a bachelor's degree of, in history at Canisius College in Buffalo, a little Jesuit school. Um, a master's degree in American history at Niagara University, which is uh, up by Niagara Falls, New York. I did a, a master's in Canadian-American relations mm -hmm. at Carleton in Ottawa. And my PhD is in British Empire from the University of Manitoba at Winnipeg. And did you, did you work on the British Empire's Global politics, or what? I, well, I, I, I'm so old, sir, that I, I worked in uh, the British Empire in what was called then the White Dominions uh, before see. World War I. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and oddly enough, South Africa was, was uh, characterized as a White Dominion. Mm -hmm. So what, what, did you just, by chance, as you said, wind up in the CIA? Uh, well, by desire. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I was working at the time in Buffalo at Union Carbide. I was a crane driver, and I was working outside on the third shift, and I was about ready to take any job that would get me outside, <laughs> away from being outside. And uh, the agency then under Mr. Reagan and uh, uh, Director Casey were hiring a lot of historians, and I took a chance, and I was very fortunate to be hired. And so the Cold War was still going on when you yes. joined up. Yes, yes. Uh, but you chose to, to actually focus on uh, the Muslim world. I did. Uh, I spent two years when I first arrived at the agency working on Europe and NATO affairs, and that was pretty deadly uh, in the sense of un being uninteresting. Uh, and in 1985, I went to work in the Directorate of Operations initially to work on uh, the support program for the Afghan Mujahideen against the uh, Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and I stayed in the rest of my career working on Middle Eastern or Islamic things. Uh, help us understand the, the skills that are required to be a CIA agent. Well, you have to be able to pass the polygraph, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think there's any, any formula. The agency is a very small d democratic place. If you have a skill of some kind and an academic record that's uh, passable, there's a job for you. I think one of the great things in my career being trained as a historian was, able to, was being able to appreciate the, um, the importance of different cultures and different religions on how events are perceived. I think that goes a long way. The ability to do a simple analogy, saying we've seen this before somewhere, is very important. And a high degree of tolerance for bureaucratic lunacy is also very important. And, and is there a sharp distinction between the analyst type on the one hand and the, the special ops type? I mean, are there, are there very different skills involved? Uh, there are different skills, sir. Uh, I think they're less, it, it depends on what area you're working in. If you're a, a, a case officer on the operations side and you're working against China, that's a whole different job than working against terrorism. 
I think in the agency, the difference between analysts and operators in the area of terrorism is much smaller than it is against traditional nation state targets, whether it's Germany or, or China or Russia. Mm -hmm. And why is that? It's because uh, one of the main reasons is because it goes across continents. When you're running an operation, for example, against mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda, very often you're working with three or four different countries on two or three different continents. And so uh, headquarters becomes very much a player. When you're working against a specific country, the people that are in country carry the basic load. Mm -hmm. But when you're working against terrorism across that geographical dispersion, uh, headquarters becomes a very much more important element to, to manage and to, to tell the people in the field what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, when, you, when you're talking about headquarters, you're talking about headquarters in the CIA. So the question yes. immediately arises, are people following terrorism in some ways better informed than people who are, are dealing with traditional nation states? Uh, they're, I wouldn't say they're better informed, sir. Their information is more broadly dispersed. Okay. If you're going to find, uh, if you're going to track Al Qaeda, for example, or or any Sunni Islamic group, you're going to have to have a familiarity with cultures in Africa, in in the Southeast Asia. So you have to be a comparativist uh, in a way. Very much so. so. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to do that, and you have to have a little. You have to have a little brass to you, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not a comfortable thing. Uh, some people are trained to be experts in the in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to work against terrorism, you also have to know what Islam looks like in the Southeast, in the South Pacific, for example. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little bit of uh, courage uh, to, 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 to expand yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have a quote here that I want to read you. This is, I think you told this, you were talking to Frontline and you said this, the test of an intelligence officer is not so much the ability to accumulate information, it's to judge between different pieces of information and not to take a piece of information and use it in a piece of analysis simply because it fits your case, but to use it because it either comes from a reliable source like signal intercepts from a human source that has been vetted over time as a reliable person or it comes from documentary information, papers you've stolen from another government or another organization. Talk a little about that because it's very intriguing. I mean, you, it, it, you have to be pretty thoughtful about what you're reading yes, uh, before you. You know, in, the, in this age, in the age of the internet, for example, you, could, you can basically construct a piece of analysis that proves that you're the queen of England, really, uh, <laughs> if you wanted to. Yeah. There's no problem with that. And, and the problem in the government at the moment, and I think we saw it in Iraq, is they do what they call cherry picking. Mm -hmm. They pick the pieces of intelligence that fit the answer that they want to arrive at. Mm -hmm. And you, really, an intelligence officer is worthless if he's not able to have the, the courage, the, the capacity to say, no, this piece of information is just not reliable. We have to go with this one. It may not fit what the, what the president wants to do, but this is the more reliable information at hand. And so it becomes a very difficult task in many ways. You have to be able to stand up and say, you know, no matter what you want to do, Mr. President, this is the reality, or, or Mr. Secretary of State or Mr. Secretary of Defense. And the, the amount of information out there is, as you know, sir, astounding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's overwhelming in many ways. And so in, in some ways, good intelligence officers today are much more valuable than they've ever been before because it's their duty to pick between the good things and the bad things, the valid things and the invalid things. Let's take a case uh, study here and, and obviously the, the, what suggests itself is the bin Laden unit. How did bin Laden, let's go back to the origins of that unit, how did he, what are, were the circumstances under which he emerged on the radar? Was it the actual attacks against uh, the facilities in Saudi Arabia and so on, or was it even before that that you began to see information that was disturbing? Well, we began to see information about Osama bin Laden during the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And uh, truth to tell, uh, we tried to get in touch with him uh, in, the, in the late 80s, middle 80s, and he hated us then. He didn't want any part of us. He had his own sources of money, his own sources of arms, and so he wouldn't talk to us. But when we uh, first began to pay very serious attention to him was after the Soviets left Afghanistan in 89. His name began to appear in places like the Balkans, in Eritrea, in Kashmir, in Mindanao. 
not that he was in control of what was going on there, but that he was providing everything from uh, inspiration on audio cassettes to false documents to some money to training. And so we really took notice of him by the middle 90s. And he also moved from Afghanistan to Khartoum. And Khartoum, Sudan at the time, was ruled by an uh, Islamic party uh, under Hassan Tarabi and uh, was attracting a lot of radical groups into the Sudan. And so it was in Sudan, really, that we began to focus on him. The reason we set up a unit was primarily because uh, uh, President Clinton's national security advisor, Mr. Lake, was fascinated with the idea of uh, terrorism uh, finances. Mm -hmm. He believed that if you could cut off the finances, you would stop terrorism. He didn't really believe that religion had anything to do with it. And so at his instigation, we set up a unit to chase bin Laden specifically in November, December 1995. And at, at what point did, did you realize that he had crossed a line and was more than just a disturbance on your radar, but actually somebody who posed a threat to the United States. By the end of 1999, sir, we had uh, we worked hard and we were lucky. It's, it very they very often go together. By the end of 96, we had been in existence for a year, and we had developed a corpus of information that indicated he was much more than one more Saudi spendthrift who was out there doling out money. That he was a hands-on person who had a plan and had an organization that was far larger than anything we had ever seen by another terrorist group. And we had the very good fortune of having a former member of his organization walk into us in Africa. And uh, it, it was a man who him had embezzled money from Al-Qaeda. And he had gone to bin Laden and said, I've done this. Uh, and bin Laden said, fine, return the money, all is forgiven. Well, he had spent the money. And so he came into us looking for protection. But the, the very interesting part was he basically gave us information that corroborated what we had collected over the last year and a half. And so by the end of 96, we knew a couple of things. First, bin Laden was not um, a Saudi ne'er-do-well. He was a hands-on, smart operator who had a long-term plan. He had an organization that was spread over at least four continents, including North America. Uh, and he had the desire to attack the United States. And probably most troublingly, in December 96, we found out he had organized a unit in 1992 made up of hard scientists, um, technicians, and engineers to try to acquire a nuclear weapon. So by the end of 96, we were very certain that this was a brand new phenomenon. Two questions come up. One is you, you mentioned that you had worked on the, uh, the unit supporting the <laughs> Afghan Mujahideen. Yes. And the question arises in the literature, did, did we create bin Laden? And then he, he, he struck it back at us after uh, we, he had been our creation. Or is it more, much more complicated, and one, your new book would suggest that, that he arises out of forces in uh, uh, the Muslim world uh, and is much more than having begun as our agent? Yeah, he, he never was our agent. Yeah. Uh, not because we didn't want to talk to him or contact him, because he wouldn't deal with us. But I think it's a case of extreme American arrogance to say that we created this phenomenon. The story of the Afghan covert action program to support the Mujahideen is basically that we allowed the Afghans to kill Soviets with AK-47s instead of Lee Enfield rifles. The glory of that victory doesn't go to the Americans at all. It goes to the Afghans. But the whole concept that we created bin Laden really is another one of those blind spots uh, that America has when it comes to trying to understand the influence of religion in the Muslim world. Bin Laden is a uh, emanation of the, the sort of awakening in Sunni Islam that came after the defeat of the Soviets in Afghanistan. Allah delivered to, to Muslim people a victory over the, one of the world's two great superpowers. We also have a tendency to, to think that he is only credible if we talk about him. President Clinton, for example, went 18 months and never said bin Laden. Mr. Bush did about the same thing. And that, to me, is also an arrogance. 
Bin Laden is credible in the Muslim world because he's defied the Americans for uh, a dozen years, has and is still alive, has hurt us, has uh, become something of a Robin Hood, uh, an heir to billions who chose to drink Afghan water for 25 years and was wounded in combat four times. So I think we do ourselves a great disservice to believe that we are his creator. Mm -hmm. uh, he's much more dangerous than anything we, we, we could possibly be responsible for. And you feel strongly that President Clinton missed many opportunities to both kill him or capture him. I think eight times that... Ten times, would, sir. Ten times, uh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I should be very clear, a, 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 a half... A, um, a bureaucrat like myself is never going to make the decision to pull the trigger on anyone. But when President Clinton says he took every opportunity he had to kill bin Laden, that's clearly not the case. He had two chances to try to capture him using CIA assets and eight different chances that I'm aware of to kill him using U.S. military air power in, in the space of one year, May 98 to May 99. But if I can add, uh, the one discouraging part of my career, uh, and I had a great career, was to find that presidents of either party are very often not prone to protect Americans first. They're worried about what will the Europeans say about me? What will the Muslim world say? Mr. Bush is no less responsible than Mr. Clinton in that regard. He had a chance to kill Osama bin Laden or capture him at Tora Bora in 2001 and they were afraid to take American casualties, so they didn't do it. He could have killed Abu Musab Zarqawi every day for a year before the invasion of Iraq, and he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think one thing that should be a very great concern to Americans in this presidential year is that they're electing presidents who don't put the security of our country, of our children, first. And a major thrust of your book is the, the blinders, the myopia, uh, together with arrogance of our foreign policy elites uh, as they confront uh, the problems that ar arise from uh, terrorism and from a leader like Osama bin Laden. Sir, th this, this war is everything, what this war is about is the impact of American intervention in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. Now it's up to Americans to decide whether that's in our interest or not, but it's not a question uh, for the enemy. What motivates the enemy, Osama bin Laden and his allies, is what we do in the Islamic world. Not who we are, not how we live, not what we believe. None of the stuff that forms our society would form theirs if they ran a country. But they're not blowing themselves up because we have women in the workplace. They're blowing themselves up because we are on, take your pick, the Arabian Peninsula, because we support the Russians in Chechnya, because we're in Iraq and Afghanistan or because, probably most importantly, we have supported uh, police states in the Arab world for the last 50 years. And, and you add to that uh, the support of Israel yes. uh, and also our dependence on energy. Well, surely America doesn't have a chance to do anything in the Middle East as long as we're dependent on, on energy. Yeah. Uh, we are stuck. We are going to be the champions of tyranny in the Middle East, whether it's e Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, as long as we are dependent on foreign oil mm -hmm. and we're backing both sides in the Arab-Israeli conflict. We are the main sponsor of both antagonists, the Saudis and the Israelis. It's a rather absurd position to be in. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you're, 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 you're telling us in your book that there are structural reasons. We have a real problem with the Middle East unless, uh, and, and we have to recognize the real discontent that emerges from our policies uh, on the one yeah. hand. But you're also suggesting that our elite, elites are, are caught in a time warp in some sense. Yes. That they have modes of responding uh, uh, that come out of the Cold War. Yes. For example, their sense of time. Oh, we don't have to deal with this problem now. We can take care of it later. Yes. I, I think that's very much the case, sir. We do a lot of talking about the Cold War being over and we need to think out of the box. Well, my argument would be that the Cold War was a, a, an out-of-the-box experience. No, we never had a situation where the world could be destroyed in, in two weeks or less. We're back, to, in many ways, to the pre-Cold War era, where nation-states are confronted by other nation-states and by popular movements around the world. 
And until we make that decision uh, or make that recognition, America can't defend itself. If you recall, when Mr. Baker and Mr. Hamilton published the, the Iraq Study Group report, it basically said, well, this is a problem, but it's a matter of management. We have to have more troops. The Europeans have to train more policemen. Mm -hmm. We have to teach people how to do taxation policy as if we had all the time in the world and there wasn't an enemy out there. Right now, America confronts the world as if we are on one side of the tennis net. We hit the ball over, run around, and hit it back to ourselves. Another aspect of the Cold War thinking beyond uh, time is proxies. Mm -hmm. When we supported proxies during the Cold War, whether it was the Afghan Muj Mujahideen or Jonas Zavimbi in, in Namibia, those men were in the field fighting without us. They were fighting for something they believed in. They were willing to spend their lives for it. That era is gone. Right now, we're looking for proxies, but we're trying to get people to do things for us that they wouldn't do off their own hook. I think Pakistan is the best example. Pakistan had no trouble with the Taliban, no trouble with bin Laden until they, tried to, they decided to help us. They're getting paid for it, absolutely. But they're not our proxies. They would not be doing this without our impetus behind them. And so I think we have to grow up a little. Mm -hmm. the, the age of proxies is over. If there's dirty work to do, we're going to have to do it ourselves. This, this thing about proxies is very important because you talk to the, ca uh, to the case of General Zia, who basically we were using him as an instrument to arm uh, the, uh, the, ta uh, the, the Mujahideen, yes. but, but in fact he had other interests, and you point to the fact that he wanted to distribute Korans uh, <laughs> in, in, the, in parts of the Soviet Union yes. in the Cold War. So, so there were really strong differences there about Absolutely, what was best sir. for him and what was best. We had to the pull the reins in on General Zia uh, because he really did want to cause trouble in Soviet Central Asia. But even Zia, you know, Zia was of the opinion that he could uh, measure the level at which the Afghan pot boiled. Well, in the, at the end of the day, all Pakistan did was distribute the arms and money and training that we provided, and the Afghans let us both because they were the ones that did the fighting. They were going to fight whether we gave them a nickel. Mm -hmm. That's not the case today. Basically, uh, Pakistan is not a surrogate. It's a mercenary. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a proxy. It's doing something for some money, but it's not going to go to the point of wrecking their own country to do it. And I don't think we recognize that, sir. You're also very critical of this notion that our elites have that somehow our notions of, of democracy can be made applicable to places like Iraq. Yes. Uh, talk a little about that. Well, and if you say something like that, if you say our, our notion of democracy uh, doesn't fit in other places, uh, you're immediately con condemned or criticized as saying, well, you're saying Muslims are inferior people, that they can't do it. Well, that's not the case at all. They happen to have a religion that doesn't separate church and state. And until there is that separation, our, our um, secular democracy is irrelevant to them. It's worse than irrelevant. We say to, the Af to Iraqis or to Afghans, Adopt the system of government. Look what it has done for us in, in North America. We have a fairly equitable society. We're prosperous. We're peaceful. All of which is very true. But what they hear is, turn your back on God and accept these man-made ways. And I, I think we don't appreciate that. In many ways, the least exportable commodity America has is its, its democracy. Uh. I sense uh, in reading your book that on the one hand you're, you're a, uh, a very uh, impassioned American nationalist, basically that you, you've read the history, you know the history, you, uh, some of your quotes I found quite remarkable, uh, and, and you're a real defender of our ideals. On the other hand, you've been a practitioner of real politic in, in some indirect way uh, as a, uh, an officer of the CIA. And, and I'm, I'm just curious uh, how you reconcile these two things in your own mind. Uh, and and the, the case in point would be the rendition program. Yeah basically, because I know you, in leading that program, and we should explain to our audience, well, explain to our audience what the rendition program was and how it came about. The rendition program began in the middle to late year of 1995, 
Uh, we had uh, begun to discover Al-Qaeda and other groups are, were, were much more um, powerful and uh, dispersed than we had thought. Mr. Lake, then the National Security Advisor, the President, Mr. Clinton, and uh, Mr. Berger uh, ordered the CIA to begin to dismantle Al-Qaeda cells around the world. And we said, yes, you know, we're, we're the President's service organization. Uh, how, where, what do you want to do with these people? And they said, that's up to you. And we said, no, you don't get it. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have, at that time, we didn't have prisons. So what they said was to take these people to countries where they were wanted for a legal process. Where they were, I'm sorry, say. Where they were wanted for a legal process. Where in other words, were, they were wanted individuals. They were right. outlaws. Yeah, right. They yeah. were warrant, there was a warrant for them or they had been I convicted okay. in absentia. Okay. They were terrorists or other kinds of criminals, which in many ways limited our ability to operate against Al-Qaeda because there was only a limited number of that species out there. Okay. Okay. But under Mr. Clinton, uh, we were to take them off the street and uh, arrange for them to be returned to the government that wanted them for a judicial process. The goals of the program, very simply, at the start were two things. First, to get people off the street who were either involved in attacks against America or were planning attacks or, their, or our allies. And the second thing was to uh, get from them at the time of their capture whatever paper or electronic documents they had at the time on them because they never expected the Americans to read those. Mm -hmm. There was no uh, plan really at all to interrogate them, mm -hmm. primarily because Al-Qaeda trains its people to, to be very tough to interrogate. They either fabricate information or they give you a lot of information that's accurate, but you spend your time running it down and it doesn't lead you anywhere because it's dated. But that was the goal of the program until Mr. Bush came in, and then we began holding people ourselves. Okay, and, and this, the, the initial program was signed off by President Clinton or by his national security? No, it, it, was, a, it was signed off by the president. There's, yeah. no, there's no program that's described as covert, covert action that can be conducted by the agency without the president's approval. Mm -hmm. And with the approval of both intelligence committees mm -hmm. in the House, the Senate, and the Congress. Uh, all of those people seem to have forgotten that they that they approved this at the time, but nonetheless, that's the way the system works. Mm -hmm. We're the CIA is peculiarly the instrument of the president of the United States, mm -hmm. whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, sir. So, so in, 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 a, in but, but let's be clear about this. So in, in, in the initial form, when, when you were involved, there, there really was no, uh, no interrogation of the prisoners. They were just seized, basically, and then turned over yes. to the Egyptians. But we, would, but, but we must have suspected that the Egyptians or whoever might wind up torturing these Well, people. sure. And yeah. we went back to the White House and we said, listen, this is what we plan to do. Do you want us to do it? Yes, was mm -hmm. the answer. Okay, well, we're going to take them to countries where they're wanted, but your State Department every year is going to say that country is a human rights abuser or its judicial processes are not what we want them to be. And everybody kind of puckered up and said, oh, that may be a problem. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, can you get these countries to say we will treat these rendered people according to our mm -hmm. own laws? I see. And we, we said, yeah, we're pretty <laughs> sure that they, country X will treat them according, but that doesn't get you off the hook. Yeah. But that's as far as it went. Mm -hmm. Now, President Clinton and Mr. Berger have said that uh, they insisted on guarantees that these prisoners would be traded according to American standards or international law. Now, I was there, I ran the operations. That was never a requirement that I knew of. Mm -hmm. That's entirely a kind of after the fact mm -hmm. uh, defense of what was done. Now, this raises a, an interesting question, which is how programs morph into something else. And uh, what, what I want to get at is I, I, I find you in your work a, a very strong defender of what we're about, basically, you know, the ideals of, of, of due process, of liberty, of what our founding fathers were about. But in, in this world of international pro, uh, politics, we wind up doing things. And I'm, I'm, I want to ask you what you see as the way that things that we do abroad come back to haunt us and change who we are? I think one thing I would say, sir, is that over the course of my career, because the presidents of the United States have been increasingly unwilling to use U.S. military power to effect 
they, they use it very temperately. They mm. don't think they can win wars anymore with it. The price of that has been mm. an increased use of covert action, whether it's by special forces in the military or by the CIA. And by its nature, that falls into kind of a secretive, dirty war category. And so I think we end up doing things, when you don't do the hard things, I think, mm -hmm. sometimes you end up doing the extreme things. Mm -hmm. We don't, it's hard to win a war. And if you don't do that, you end up still having to def defend America, but you try to do it in another way, whether it's renditions or some other kind of covert action program. So what, I think what we're seeing is the tradition of American presidents in the last three administrations to increasingly use covert action. Uh, and the problem is it can be effective in a very small scale, but it can't defend America by itself. Mm -hmm. It has to be complemented by something else, whether it's military, public diplomacy, economic policy, whatever it is. But I, I, my, for my own two cents worth, I've never looked at foreign policy as something that um, defines what America is. It defends what America is. And foreign policy is to make sure that the, the, the scope and the area of liberty and freedom of equality of condition at home expands, not overseas. I have, I have no, no qualm about doing whatever the president orders as long as it's legal to defend the United States. Mm -hmm. So, so in what, what we get after 9-11 is this program that you've just described being sort of out there and morphing into something uh, that was very different uh, and that it could then pose a threat to who we are. Well, it was, a different, it was different in uh, degree, certainly. After 9-11, uh, Richard Betts from Columbia has written that only in America could the U.S. military not be prepared to defend the United States mm -hmm. proper. After 9-11, the CIA was about the only game in town. The Bush White House pushed on the CIA to, be, to, extra, to um, accelerate the rendition program. Under Mr. Clinton, we had focused on very senior Al-Qaeda people. That went down a little bit. The bar went down a little bit, and we began to pick other people up. In addition, we uh, uh, also began holding people which has always been odd to me. I, I would have thought that the Human Rights Committee would, or community would rather have Americans holding people than the Egyptians, but apparently not. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the Bush administration thought we would be better at interrogating than uh, other people. So we began doing that. Um, I, th I think the real problem was that we didn't take advantage of the international agreements that were out there. I believe we're at war with these people. These are not criminals. These are not um, gangsters. These are prisoners of war. We should have treated them as such. We put them in a stockade like we did Germans and Japanese, let the Red Cross in, and let, uh, you know, let them write letters to their mom, all of that stuff. And I think that would have saved America a lot of grief. But really, sir, the, the, real, the real issue here is for the first time in Western history, we're fighting an enemy that we have prisoners of war we probably can never release. Because of their religious motivation, if we release them, they will go back to what they were doing beforehand. And we've had close to four dozen people that were released from Guantanamo that we have either killed on the battlefield in Iraq or Afghanistan or recaptured after their initial release. So a problem for the Western community is what do we do with these people? But so far we haven't discussed that at all. And, and should they be put in our court system or, or should we, there be new international protocols to deal with them? Well, you know, I think there's going to have to be the latter, sir. When we set up the program in 95, the Department of Justice was very clear that the American court system could not, could not accommodate them. The CIA has never physically grabbed someone. The rendition program is finding a target in a country where the country's government will arrest him and then deliver him to a third country that wants him for judicial processes. Uh, if you, it, that's the way the system works. Originally. Originally. Yeah. It, and and the, the problem is uh, that, again, that's a very, very limited 
uh, way to defend America. And I don't think it's a particular, like, it was never designed, let me say, it was never designed to be the U.S. counterterrorism program. It was designed to complement the efforts of all the other departments. It's turned out to be the only U.S. government counterterrorism program that's been effective and increasingly less effective because now it's become a political football. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I thought you were suggesting that, that really torture may not work, basically, because, uh, for example, Al-Qaeda was training its people to, uh, to essentially give information that wasn't useful yes. or yes. Uh, not give any information. And also, they, they, te they train them very clearly that you can become a martyr on the battlefield or in a Saudi, Egyptian, or an American jail. Mm -hmm. uh, I was never one who thought it was worth paying much attention to interrogating people. Now, General Hayden, who's now the, the chief of CIA, has said that this is, they've, they've acquired very important information through what they call enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, I'm not in a position to know, uh, to disprove that. So I think if General Hayden says that that's the case, then that's probably exactly what's going on at the moment, that we are getting important information from the prisoners that we have uh, captured. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not one that thinks interrogations bring you an awful lot. Uh, let's get back to your argument about American elites, because what, what you're saying is that their myopia, which comes from their arrogance, from the atavisms left from the Cold War, from their conceptual errors, for example, the enemy is a nation state, it's Iraq, it's not a terrorist group, yeah. that, that all of these things uh, including, by the way, your argument that they want to put things off because they're focused on their political situation yeah. and the electoral process and so on. That all of these things, uh, that all of these uh, problems lead our elites to essentially go after the wrong instruments, basically, in dealing with the problem. I think that's very much the case, sir, that, and especially the latter. Uh, the, the political process has pervaded everything. There is no discussion of how best to defend America without having two opposing partisan views. There's no united approach to it. And if there's a touch of genius in bin Laden, and I think there is, mm -hmm. is that he's, he's identified U.S. foreign policies as an attack on Islam. And that set of foreign policies is inextricably bound up with American domestic politics. Uh, Israel. You know, I, a martyrdom operation is at hand for any American politician who criticizes Israel or questions the value of the relationship. You mean political? Political, political martyrdom. Political yeah. martyrdom. No uh, politician that we've encountered yet has been willing to run on the, on the, on the platform of, we need to make sure we're energy self-sufficient, and so prices have to go up. No one uh, in, in any of the political parties is willing to say, we're going to spend the lives of your sons and daughters uh, so the Saudi government family can continue to steal the profits from their people and, and put them in banks in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very difficult situation, but we haven't found a politician who's willing to, to uh, address the issue. And it's not that this is hard to understand, mm -hmm. doctor. If this, was a, if this was rocket science, it wouldn't come from me. This is, this is very apparent. And um, I've never thought of our politicians as being stupid. They see it as well as I see it, or you see it, or anyone sees it. But they don't have the moral courage to say, listen to Americans. If you want this, this war is about what we do. We need as a nation, as a community, if, to decide. If we want to continue doing this, fine. But it's, this is what it's going to cost. But there's no one out there except Mr. Paul tried to raise it during the campaign, and he was identified as a traitor or an anti-American. And, and let's be clear, when you say what we do, you mean not what we're doing here at home, but the policies abroad. The Islamic, if, if there's any more insular society than the American society, it's Muslim society. Mm -hmm. They don't much care what goes on in our country. And in fact, to the extent that they know what's going on, they admire it. The, the ability of Americans to feed their kids and educate them find housing, find work, speak their minds. All the polling shows that, that, that that's uh, admired in the Muslim world. We have an inability to, to believe, for some reason, that Muslims can make a distinction between Americans and their government. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. My travels in the Middle East, I think you could ask any intelligence officer, any military officer who traveled in the Middle East, they are invariably, invariably welcomed by Muslims. Muslims like Americans. The discussion around the dinner table when they have you to dinner always turns to why is your government supporting Mubarak who's, who's torturing Muslims. Mm -hmm. But as people, we're not hated. Mm -hmm. And yet our politicians continue to tell Americans that um, the Muslim world in, in, intends to wipe you out, to force you to convert, to make your daughters wear burqas to grammar school. And that's, that's just nonsense. And, and it doesn't hurt anyone, sir, but us, mm -hmm. because we underestimate the threat of the enemy. What, what are the threats that we should be worried about? You talk about that in your book. I, I think we should be very worried about a th uh, an enemy we can't deter. Um, we have spent hundreds of billions of dollars since 9-11. The government in June, through the national intelligence estimate, says we haven't beaten al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is stronger than it used to be, and it has more allies. The threat to America, uh, look at our borders. We have let the discussion of border control and immigration control evolve into a di discussion of refugee rights and human rights. Well, if we have an enemy we can't deter, and we have open borders, how in the world are we ever going to ha expect our law enforcement to protect us in this country? But that's just, it's another issue that our politicians won't take on. Mm -hmm. America needs immigrants. My, my grandparents were immigrants. But there's no reason people can't come in in an orderly manner so we can protect ourselves. But mm -hmm. the politicians are courting the Hispanic vote. They're courting the free traders. They're the business community who wants cheap labor. None of that protects America. One of the criticisms that I think one can make against your book and your ideas is There are probably that, many, sir. Yeah, well, <laughs> let, let's talk about one. And that is that, that America is really, uh, at this point in time, probably still the most important global power. And with that global power comes global responsibility and global interests. And some of those interests are manifested through the constraints that are put on us by things like international law, the requirements of international trade, uh, uh, rules about warfare, and so on. So some of this uh, that, that you sort of associate with kind of do-good values that uh, demonstrate that our leaders have sold out the nation and the national interest. Talk a little about that, because to be fair to our leaders, they're caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the narrow national interests that a middle great power like France or Britain would have, versus those set of interests that a global power has, but the additional ones of global responsibility. You can be a global power without being an interventionist power. There are things that occur on this earth that may distress us, may upset us, but ultimately have no impact on American interests. What I would argue is that we continue to plod down the road as if we still live in the Cold War era. The Cold War was really a period of extraordinary peace in the world and prosperity. It was a dangerous, terrible, situation, but once the Soviets acquired nuclear weapons, there was a standoff and there was a certain amount of, of peace. The rules of the Cold War don't apply anymore mm -hmm. in all instances. We're, we're certainly not, for example, uh, we don't have the bottomless pit of goodwill that we had during the Cold War. When we were condemning the Soviets and fighting the Soviets, Anybody in the Western community could see that, well, the Americans might be pushy and they might be bossy, but at the end of the day, do we want the Red mm -hmm. Army in the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. The answer was no. We're more or less, we're, we're much more alone than we used to be. And we're much more, in my mind, we're much more threatened than we were during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an enemy, we, as I said, we can't deter. This is an enemy which we are motivating, and we haven't recognized that yet, or we haven't accepted that. And I personally think that it's an it's a it's a excuse to say, well, we have international agreements, we have this, we have that. We don't have anything unless your country survives. Mm -hmm. And no country has a right to survive. No, it does, it's not in the Ten Commandments. It's not given by God. You survive if you can. 
And I think America has to begin to realize that it is a vulnerable country. You know, just take energy. Um, people always fall back when you talk about energy to say, well, it's a fungible commodity, let the market take care of it. Well, we as Americans have frittered away our freedom of uh, making a decision between peace and war on energy. If something happens, not only in the Muslim world, but if something happens in the Gulf of Guinea that stops production, we will go to war to restore it. So I think, you know, it, it's, there's certainly leftover international regulations, international ideas that you have to cope with. But I think we've lost the idea that the first job of American politicians is not to be citizens of the world, mm -hmm. but to be citizens of America. Mm -hmm. So, so I noticed you thanked uh, Pat Buchanan at the beginning of your book. I mean, is that where you come down, or, or, or are you not that nationalistic where you, you take a, an extreme position about where we should be in the world? Because as I listen to you, you, you seem to be more moderate than you seem to be in some places <laughs> in your book. I think Pat Buchanan had it exactly correct when he said that Isolationism is not a philosophy, it's a slur. Mm -hmm. Americans since the founding have uh, governed, have created and governed a nation that has been fully involved in the world in terms of commerce and finance, in business, in education, in science. We have never been an isolationist country. We have been a non-interventionist country at our best. But I, I, I think that what I am, first of all, is a nationalist. I think it's important that it's important to the world, but it's important to America to survive as a viable as a viable entity. That our first duty is to ourselves, uh, not to build walls around America, but to make sure that we do the best we can for the American people before we look abroad. No one, least of all me, says we can build a fortress America. You can't mm. do it but you can pick and choose the, the issues you need to become involved in. So, so what would uh, it take to, to get our leadership to move in the direction that you're talking? Is it public education? Is it books like this? Is it political leaders who will actually sort of break with what has been the bipartisan foreign policy consensus about the way we should deal with the world? You know, sir, I think the only thing that's going to do it is another attack in America by Al-Qaeda or a related group that kills tens of thousands of Americans. Because then I think it'll become a grassroots issue. I'm almost of the opinion that it's like the environment. Uh, the government basically didn't do much about energy and environment since the first oil embargo in 35, uh, 35 years ago. Now we're seeing more and more everyday Americans buying hybrid cars and doing things to take care of the problem, or start to. Mm -hmm. I think it's gotta come from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, until we get attacked again. It's, very, it's a callous thing to say, but I think it's the truth. The, another point you hit on, though, I think is very important, and that is for being the most educated country on Earth, we are perhaps the least educated country on Earth. The idea that our leaders should understand Islam and the intricacies of praying and uh, Islamic history, that's important, but you can forgive them for not knowing those things. You can't forgive them for not knowing the history of our country. For Mr. Bush or Mr. Clinton or any of these politicians to think that we can take the American experience, which goes back to when? Runnymede in mm -hmm. 1215, 800 years, and put that on a CD-ROM and give it to Mr. Maliki in Iraq or Mr. Karzai in Afghanistan in, in entirely different societies and say, here, take six weeks or six months and plug this in. To me, speaks to the ignorance of our governing class of either ignorance about the American experience or disdain for it. Mm -hmm. That somehow it was easy for us to get from 1215 to 2008, that there wasn't world wars and civil wars and slavery and segregation. So I think we need a, a much more um, appreciative analysis of what America is and how it got to be what it is. And, and is that what keeps us from morphing, changing into something else because of the way we uh, misuse the instruments of war and counterterrorism to fight the terrorists? I, I think, sir, that, that 
somehow we think, because we think somehow that the American, ex the current American experience just popped up without any kind of work, and it didn't matter that we were uh, Anglo-American, uh, Old Testament, English-speaking, um, Greek inheritance country, mm -hmm. that we don't realize how we got to where we are, we think we can take our model and put it into a country that has none of that groundwork. Mm -hmm. um, Iraq, could Iraq be democratic? Why not? But it can't be democratic like we are until it, it has a different sort of philosophy, a different sort of religion, a different sort of society. We, we, we just, we, we also have an extraordinarily hard time accepting that in 2008 there's anyone in the world who really believes in God to the extent that they shape every facet of their life mm -hmm. according to that belief. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to admit it. We think it's archaic. We think it's silly. And yet, we have an enemy that's driven by their faith. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're suggesting that the thing that might turn us around, God forbid, is, a, is you know, another attack and then but w how can we be sure that we won't become worse after such attack that we will do a kind of a, a bush too uh, in our response uh, well it's uh, a very interesting situation sir because there's really not much of an opportunity to do a bush too yeah the one thing that President Bush has ensured is that if we get attacked again we have absolutely nothing to respond against it's another kind of first. Well, you mean with or again? Uh, uh, say that again. We do, we, what, if we get attacked again, yeah. America will be standing quivering with rage with absolutely nothing to hit out against. I see. No target. No target that yes. makes, makes any difference. There's targets, but only targets that would make things worse. And that may be a, a first in world mm -hmm. history. That, for example, the greatest power on earth could lose a city to a nuclear device and have absolutely nothing to respond against. I think right now, if it happened in the next eight months, we'd kick hell out of the Iranians. But after that, there's no target. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, you are a person who left the CIA. In some ways, you're a, a dissenter from American opinion. What, what have been the cost to you? And it, do you, have, have, have you lost the support of your uh, colleagues who were once in the CIA, or uh, I know you have not used secret sources in any of these publications. You, you've, it's your ideas and what's in the public domain. But, but uh, talk a little about that because you're in Berkeley, and hey, yeah. we're about dissent. <laughs> sure, I, I think the bulk of what I say uh, is boilerplate to the people who work this issue. Mm -hmm. There's virtually no one in the intelligence community at the working level or the mid-level management who thinks that this war has anything to do with, with the way we live or what mm -hmm. we think. Um, I don't know what the agency thinks of, of, of me. All of my work has to be vetted by them before it's published and I get along very well with the people who do that. Uh, and I left, the, the only cost to me of what I've done is I left a job that I loved. Uh, I had no animosity toward the agency when I left. I still think it's the best place to work. I resigned because I thought the 9-11 Commission had, had hurt America by not finding anyone responsible for anything before 9-11. And I couldn't speak about that from the agency, so I left. So I, I have no gripes. You know, I think if I, if I could go back to the agency, I'd go back tomorrow. One last question, a brief answer. Uh, how would you uh, advise students who sort of want to be involved in international politics, who want to uh, represent the United States or work for the United States in, in dealing with the Muslim world? I think uh, my own view, and it's a terribly biased view, but I think the agency, as I said, is the best, best place to work in the world. I think it, it, it attracts the best and the brightest in America, uh, and it's a, a job very worth doing, and it's a job that has kind of immediate gratification because it's something that matters every day. Well, on that note, I want to thank you, uh, Michael, for being here. I want to show your book and recommend it uh, highly to our audience, whether they disagree or agree with all or some of it. It's, it's definitely worth reading. Thank you very kindly, sir. And thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.